today on Rambling About Cars. GM is going all electric in 14 years. So, of course, we're going to revisit some of the good and not so good engines, internal combustion variety of GM's past. And then just for the fun of it, we're going to take a look at some quirky GM cars that we might want to add to our garage someday. It's Rambling About Cars. I'm Christopher Smith. Welcome, friends, foes, ladies and gentlemen, seekers of speed. Across the screen from me is Chris Bruce. Chris, what else have we got going on here today? Well, we're starting things off talking about General Motors engines. And the reason we're doing that are two very interesting pieces of news we've got. Um, last week, GM announced that as of 2035, they are going to stop offering internal combustion engines in their light cars. So basically, you might still be able to get a V8 in your Silverado 2500 or something like that, but vast majority of their vehicles, probably even performance stuff like your Corvette, if the Camaro is still around then, those are all going to be EVs or maybe plug-in hybrids, but basically gas, purely gas-powered engines are not in their future. And so I wrote up, wrote up this story last week, and it really kind of got my gear spinning that, you know, GM is one of the oldest automakers in the world. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they've got over 100 years of history, and there are some absolutely fantastic internal combustion engines in that time. Mm -hmm. um, and also, interestingly, this week, and this is a story that you wrote about, it is that you know Cadillac announced that the new uh, CT4V Blackwing and CT5V Blackwing those are going to be the last V models from Cadillac with internal combustion engines, and so it really seems like GM serious about this, or at least for right now. Um, so yeah, it's it's a weird time. Uh, do you have anything to add about the the Cadillac part of that? Well, I mean. Yes and no. I guess the bigger question is whether or not GM can actually pull this off. Yeah, you know that's something our commenters um, brought up as well. Is that you know twenty thirty five is a long time away, <laughs> and it, it, it is a long time away. Sometimes make makes promises it doesn't necessarily keep. So they they sometimes don't always follow through most of the all of the time maybe i i i don't want to i don't want to sound too harsh on gm because no no no, no. I, I mean they're 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 going for it and and i mean frankly they have to go for it right the the whole industry is moving in that direction and we're we're faced with a gm lineup right now that is pretty much almost completely devoid of any electrification. Um, I mean, they have some, uh, just what, just a couple of vehicles right off the top of my head. Of course, they've got the, the GMC Hummer that, okay, I, I don't know if a $110,000 luxury electric pickup truck is really going to be the, uh, the mainstream savior, but yeah, 14 years, can they get there? And Cadillac, I mean, these, uh, these amazing looking sports sedans, that's going to be the the end of an era. That'll be the last internal combustion Cadillac V series cars you're going to get. So, are we ready to pour one out? Maybe not just yet, because I mean, 14 years is a long ways away. Who knows what's going to happen between now and then? But this could be the beginning of the end. Yeah, and with that in mind, we kind of wanted to talk about important GM engines, and we're just bringing up Cadillac, and so. Let's talk about Cadillac some more. And yes, get us started. Exactly. With that in mind, I want to talk about the Cadillac V16 engine. And generally, these days, when we think V16 engines, we kind of the natural thought is Bugatti, you know, with their W16, slightly different layout, but same number of cylinders. Um, but Cadillac had one way back in 1930. It's to, essentially from the, some of the reading I've done, it might kind of sort of be two Buick straight eights with a shared crankshaft. You know, they were kind of using what was around. I, I got to be honest with you. I wasn't able to put the level of research in that I would have liked to be able to confirm that. But regardless, it's a big engine with a it lot is. of cylinders that looks really, it's just a good looking hunk of metal is what and I mean. Is. I mean, when we're talking back in the 1930s, cars from the 1930s, in my opinion, don't get the attention they deserve. I mean, there's, there's, 
it seems like a small group of people that really understand and appreciate those cars. But for the most part, people go to the fifties or the sixties. Yeah. If you pull into cars and coffee in a 1930s Packard or a Duesenberg or a V16 Cadillac, you will get all of the attention. I don't care what else is there because those cars are just so big, so majestic Engines like this are the reason why. And uh, if if you're not following us on YouTube, like and subscribe. Go to our YouTube channel. Yeah, we have we have the video up here, and we've got a we've got a picture of the old V16 up here. How much horsepower did that make? So that is a 7.4 liter engine, which is still big by today's standards. You know, what's uh, Ford's Godzilla? Is that a 7.2? That, 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 it's a 7.3. But if you think seven about three. it, okay. th this has this has twice as many cylinders. So I yeah, mean, it's exactly. I mean, it's it's a big engine, but I mean that that's a pretty small, uh, you know, bore and stroke per per cylinder. Yeah. Um, and again, you have to keep in mind that this is 1930. Um, I'm sorry. My dog is noticing people coming and going in the background. Um, uh, he likes the engine, too. Yeah, he loves V16s. It's weird. He's a V16 <laughs> fan. That's right. Every time. You anyway, um, so this engine dis displaces 7.4 liters, and it is making 165 horsepower which by today's standards, we kind of have to admit that's maybe not impressive, but also in 1930, you know, that's quite is, a bit. That's this is almost a hundred years ago. I mean, it, it's, we're it kinda, up, yeah, it, it kind of gives you the willies. I mean, we're talking almost a hundred years ago, 30 years prior to that engine, people were still primarily riding horses. Absolutely. And so let's see what kind of vehicle that was going into. And so basically, um, Cadillac had kind of sorted two generations, quote unquote, of this engine. They had one that started in 1930, and then they started kind of introducing new body styles in the late 1930s. And at, at that time, they kind of tweaked things. So the early 30s, I'll have a picture of that right here for so you many good cars folks. oh yeah so many good cars from this era so this is a 1930 model <laughs> look at i mean come on look at that nothing else looks like cars from the 30s nothing no 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 not at all um and so yeah it it kind of looks like it's hard to even describe what it looks like because nothing looks like that today it's just a just a big hunk of metal, like which is similar to how I described the engine moving down the road. Um, by you know later on, by 37, 38, it begins to look a little bit more like kind of cars we imagine today. Mm -hmm. um, so here is a photo of that um, right here. Um, and so that that looks more like a car from the forties that you would see, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you watched a Christmas story or I'm trying to think other, if you watched any film noir, if you've ever seen a movie with Humphrey <laughs> Bogart in it, you know, the rich guy, the guy that he's going to in the greenhouse, he's probably riding around in something like this. Um, but and, it also doesn't look that it's old fashioned, but it's not like coach and buggy old. -fashioned. Right. Right. Thirties. You still kind of had that coach and buggy feel right in, in the design. And that's really the era where Cadillac established itself as an amazing, proper, world-class quality uh, luxury automaker, and yeah. it, and it stuck with them. And I mean, today, I mean, I mean, yeah, Cadillacs are still luxurious today. I think a lot of people, especially younger people, don't really understand just where Cadillac came from with cars like this. Oh, just fantastic. Thanks for bringing up the V16. That's and just a quick note. So the one that we're looking at in this model is actually lower displacement. It's a 7.1 liter, but it's making a decent chunk more power. It's making 185 horsepower versus what did I say? About 130 from the other one, 135, I believe. So it, it just kind of shows the level of progression that happened during that period as well. Right. And then of course, you know, here comes world war two. Everybody has to, has to change gears. Yeah. Um, but uh, just a, just a fabulous period for GM. I mean, for, for a lot of automakers, but GM in particular, um, can I bump us forward a little bit? Of course you can. Let's see here. I, I want to bump us forward just a little bit. Um, we'll go up to 1955. Now, anybody out there that's, that considers themselves a fan of general motors 
or Chevrolet, and especially the fans of the V8, will know why 1955 is important. That's when we saw the Chevrolet small block V8 just hit the scene. And I mean, I'm going to try not to fanboy out. Um, I'm not, I'm not the biggest GM fan, but you're going to be hard pressed to convince me that there isn't a more significant engine in the entirety of automotive history than the GM small block V8 that came out in 1955. I mean, we're talking about the engine. I mean, this, this was, this was the basis for the 283, the 327, the 350 that even still today with the, with the LS engines, um, I mean, there's still that connection to that small block, original small block Chevy V8. Definitely. I'm going to, I'm going to toss up a picture here. Um, I mean, that's, to me, that's one of the more iconic 350 images. This is a 1985 Corvette, I think. Mm -hmm. C4 Corvette, 5.7 liter, yeah. 350, the, the tune port injection. Uh, I mean, this engine was used in muscle cars. This engine was used in work trucks, work vehicles, just standard everyday vehicles. It was all over the world. And listeners, if you want to fight me on this, let's <laughs> let's do it. You know, email us at podcast.com. The I this this can't be overstated. Small block Chevy V8. It's been used in so many aftermarket uh, applications. It remains to this day one of the cheapest engines you can build to to make crazy power yeah. to go fast. That's that's why you see so many 350 swaps. And I'm not even talking about the LS swaps. I'm talking about the older school engines. I mean, I mean, Bruce, am I crazy here? No, you're not crazy at all. Here, I've actually got a picture already up here of the 55 version so people can kind of see how things changed over time. Yeah, um, I mean it I mean oh it I mean it it certainly changed but I mean at its core. Oh yeah, no. The it's not that you could necessarily swap over bits and pieces, it's just that everything evolved over time. Mm -hmm. So the you know, the engine that's in your C8 Corvette today it's not that you could take any pieces out of what we're showing no. here. It's just that, you know, everything kind of moved through time and that the same, uh, I guess, legacy. I don't know. This, there's an evolution there. There's automotive evolution happening where, you know, someone figures out that something is better, stronger, whatever, and they incorporate that. And then something better materials come along and so on and so on and so on. And so you get for, you go from this engine to what's in a Corvette today, and it yeah it, it's a very 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 important legacy. It it is, and I mean I know there are going to be people out there that that are going to say they'll say oh the the flathead Ford is is better or um, um, Ferrari's Colombo V12. No, sorry, those engines didn't go in anywhere near as many vehicles as this small block Chevy. Now, well, mind you, this is this is coming from a guy that has a Ford Mustang in his garage. Okay. So you have, you have to, you have to acknowledge this. So I have to admit this to our listeners. I don't have the quote in front of me right now, but Giotto Bizzarini, who was famous, a very famous Ferrari engineer back in the day. So I, I don't know the exact story, but he left Ferrari and created his own company, Bizzarini and created the Bizzarini 5300 GT. Um, Smith, maybe while I'm telling this story a little bit, you can kind of, maybe pull up a photo of it, of that car for me. Um, but he what famously said, what is it again? Uh, a Bizzarini 5300 GT. Um, and that was a car with gorgeous Italian styling, but has a Chevy small block under the hood. <laughs> and he famously said that the Chevy small block was every bit, as good, if not better, than the Ferrari engine V8 engines that he was that were in Ferraris, and you know, I assume there's probably some marketing in that. I assume there's probably some bad blood with Ferrari in that, but it's still we can't take away the importance and the engineering kind of mastery and simplicity from the small block especially that someone that was putting it into 
quote unquote Italian supercars. Cause you have to realize that back at that period, there were a lot, there were, you know, Chrysler engines, Ford engines, V8s, where these European coach builders would build these gorgeous cars, but for, you know, whether it's money, availability, whatever, they would take American muscle car mm -hmm. engines and shove them into that. Um, oh yeah. So yeah. Yeah, we've got a photo up here now for those on YouTube. And uh, and if you're not following us on YouTube, um, I mean, stick with us on Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever you're at. You do get a little extra element from YouTube. Yeah. That, that is a fabulous car. And, um, you know, you were talking about coach building. And, I mean, this is a little bit of a tangent. But, I mean, what a lost art that was. I mean, how many people today wouldn't even know what you mean by by coach building? I mean, taking taking an existing car and we're just going to build a whole new body. And, and drop it on there. Such a, such a lost art. So many things. And you know what? Maybe, maybe that can come back with the, uh, with electric powertrains there. I mean, the, those chassis are going to be a little bit more generic. I'm well, getting, this, I'm getting off track here though. Well, it, let's, let's take this tangent just for a second. Cause we, oh, had boy. This, I need another drink for that. Uh, this will be a tiny one. Um, <laughs> but our boss, John Neff, he has talked about how Porsche should just buy singer outright. And, I disagree with him just because kind of Singer and other companies like that are sort of the modern coach builders to me that they're taking very, you know, they're taking kind of a mix of off the shelf parts and bespoke parts and mixing them together and creating something really special. So I think it would be kind of a shame uh, if, you know. I, I would agree. Bought out Singer. Sing, if Porsche bought out Singer and just started pumping out Porsche Singers, and it just it wouldn't. Be. It, it's not re, It's not really Singer at that point, is it? I mean, there's it's not there's really Porsche either. It's like some. It, yeah. No, no. You you make a good point there. I I wonder. I wonder what Mercedes AMG, aka yeah. just AMG. I wonder what they would have been like if if Mercedes hadn't have absorbed AMG. I mean, when you look back at those early AMG cars, I mean. AMGs are still amazing, yeah, course, but but there were but there were, for me there was just a little kind of extra attitude in those early AMG models before it was officially uh, just an AMG thing. So okay, and, uh, tangent tangent over. No, we need to talk no, about quick, the super quick. Oh my god, okay. AMG! What? We'll get there in a second. So <laughs> the other thing Hang is on, that folks. if people look it up, there are AMG tuned Mitsubishi's. Yes, oh, I love those. Come like, on. So you know. Yeah, today we associate AMG with uh, Mercedes Benz, but there is a they tuned Mitsubishi engines as well, and they're really yes. interesting. Okay, okay, separate tangent. We're back back to the Bizzarini tangent. <laughs> we, we've moved, it's like Inception now. The photo we're showing now, you can very clearly tell that that's a Chevy small block with a custom intake on it, with what look like Weber DCOEs. Um, and so it's pushed way back in the firewall, but that is in a Bizzarini. So that's how it, the packaging worked. There. Oh, it, it, it's <laughs> no, <laughs> we could, and you know, Bruce and I were kind of talking about this prior. Um, this is one of those subjects that is impossible to cover in full um, or even in like 1% in, in our little hour podcast. Right. I, I think we're going to revisit this and I especially think we're going to hear back from you, the listeners, because I know there are going to be people out there. I, in fact, I can, I can feel them right now. I we're hope still, so. Because... We're, we're still a few days from this being posted, but I could already feel people saying small block Chevy. No, you're stupid. It's the big blocks that matter. It's the big blocks that matter. And then there's going to be the Dodge guys that are like, are you kidding? The Hemi is is all that matters and there'll be the porsche people could, that are I, like come on the, come on you're gonna just dump on a flat six oh we we need to hear from everybody on this and so i have know, maybe we'll all get together and just have a big dad, fight i have this opinion only because my dad gave it to me but that the dodge 440 was in terms of street ability use was better than the hemi in his opinion and i've never driven either one of those cars but he's my dad, so I'm going to agree with him. <laughs> I mean, there, there are a lot of people that will say the same thing. That would want a 440 over a Hemi. But we're talking about GM. Yes. Bruce, do you, do you, got, a, you got something to move us up with from the small I, block? I do, but 
we're actually going to take a few years step backward in terms okay. of years, in terms of timing. So I want to bring up the Oldsmobile Rocket 88. It would, you know, um, I, I'm going to show an engine view first, and then we'll look actually, oh, I lied. That's the car. It's a gorgeous car. Oh, uh, so that's yeah, an Oldsmobile 88. It is this so is good. 1949, as you can tell from the guy's uh, license plate. Um, and this... Some people will argue is the first muscle car. We've had this conversation before. The definition of the first muscle car varies wildly. But basically what you have to understand is that within General Motors for a long time, Cadillac kind of got the the best of the best. And for valid reason, you know, we talked about their V16 just a second ago, but this Oldsmobile 88 and 49 with its V8 engine was kind of the first time that that sort of power within the GM family was available to the normal person. You know, Ford had their flathead V8, but, you know, GM was a bit slower at that period to get there. And this was kind of the start. So you have, you know, the Chevy small block coming in 55, but, you know, if you were... If you if you were a middle class guy in the late forties, then this is kind of what you were looking at. Um, and yeah, it's it's just interesting to think about that in GM's history. That you kind of think GM V eight Chevy, but Oldsmobile was kind of there first. That yeah. No, you know it's interesting you brought that up because I've known a few people you know, car people that would introduce their car by also introducing their engine. And I think when you say, Oh, it's got the rocket in it. I mean, I, that's, that's one of those engines where the person just doesn't want to introduce, Hey, I've, I've got this Oldsmobile. I got this Oldsmobile with a rocket V8. Right. And you can see they put rocket right on the valve. Yeah. Like I mean, I mean, I mean that. that's, that's, I mean, yeah, that's a source of pride. I, I've known a few people and, Curiously, I haven't really talked to anybody else that have that I've at least that I've remembered that felt the need to introduce their engine along with their car, right? I mean, there are some cars where maybe you have to explain why you're driving the car. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, that was one, it's like the, the cutlass is cool, man. You don't need to, you don't need to just uh, I got a rocket, I got a rocket in the cutlass, you know? Yeah. You know, just just one of those things. Can I can I move us forward a little bit? Where yeah, we, we got so many more engines to talk about, and just nearly not enough time. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to jump up to the 400 Pontiac. Just we're just going to touch on it really quick because I mean, really, this was sort of like the engine. This is sort of like Ford's five liter V8 for the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. It's I mean, I mean, if you had a Pontiac Trans Am with a 6.6 .6 liter, you know, it was the 400. I mean, okay, uh, that picture is kind of tiny, but. Is is there a more iconic muscle car, I guess, from the seventies, at least in America, than than a Pontiac Trans Am, Firebird Trans Am? Not from the seventies. The, the, the Bandit That's Special kinda... Edition. Yeah. You know, well, and well, and the and here's here's why I'm also calling out the four hundred because I think was it I think I can't remember if it was seventy seven or seventy eight where it got a slight power boost, and they were putting out I think like two hundred and twenty horsepower in nineteen seventy eight. That was huge. Mm -hmm. If you looked at the top of the dog 78 Mustang 2, now again, I'm a I'm actually a Mustang fan and I like the Mustang 2. I think those were maxing out at 130 or 140, something like that, with with the V8 with their five liter. This engine kind of kept the, the muscle car alive, you could say during the darkest period right there at the late seventies, early eighties, when, when the power levels were just really, really at their lowest. I think, I think the Corvette was hundred and there was a bad, what was 180 bad something. Year? Yeah. Is that at 77, seven, there's a really rough year for the Corvette that it's, it has a big V eight and isn't making much power. It's 77 right. or 78, I believe. So, I, I mean, I, I think for a lot of people and, and it's true for me, that car was still kind of a bastion of at least a little bit of, of muscle and grit at the lowest point. I'll also hold on to the mic here just really quick. Um, since we're talking about Corvette, I don't have a picture here in front of me. I don't know if Bruce, you want to try to find one really quick. 
I've always been a big fan, and this goes back to the small block Chevy. Although this is this, there's never been a small block Chevy V8 like this one. I'm talking about the C4 Corvette ZR1. It had the 5.7 liter V8, but it was a double overhead cam engine. You know that, who made that right, or who kind of engineered that? Lotus was involved in that, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I mean, hi, if if you've never heard one, I've I've been fortunate to hear them like live and in person. They sound nothing like, I mean, you people that go to car shows, car events, they, you can tell, you know, the, the sound of a push rod, small block Chevy, this engine sounded nothing like those. They redlined at seven grand. They were 375 horse. And then I think they ended up at 405 horse. I mean, they even look similar. They do I mean, look similar. I, 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 I mean, you get into the the devil is in the details yeah you, you get in close and you say well that uh those heads are much much larger well, that's because they were double overhead cam 32 valves sitting in there yeah that's i mean that's just i think that's such an incredible engine um i i couldn't do this podcast without throwing out my love for the c4 zr1 bruce what else you got well, so that's the issue we're having now. You, know, you and I, we kind of plan these things out. We we like we, to we have kind of two segments. We honestly and, try. You know, we have an, a kind of a rough outline we go by, and we've kind of run out of time on this segment, unfortunately. You know, I, I had this whole long diatribe about the Buick 215, which is their aluminum V8 that they eventually sold to Rover and got put into a bunch of like Land Rovers and <laughs> MGs and stuff like that. But oh wait, Buick also cut it down and turned it into the Fireball V6, which they then sold the rights to Jeep and it became their Dauntless V6. But oh wait, an evolution of that engine became the 3800 series that lasted and forever and got supercharged. And we've got all this stuff in the outline and sadly, we don't have time to go over it. You were going to talk about the quad four and like the quad how four. Kind of, so it, it, it's just we're we're going to have to we're going to have to do part. We're going to have to this. revisit this is what's going to happen. Just like we're going to have to revisit the discussion on sedans and coupes and shooting brakes. Thank you, Bruce, though, for shouting out the thirty eight hundred. We would have had death threats if we were talking about great GM engines and then never mentioned the 3,800 that V six is just, you Especially can't the supercharged it. version is just a, it was a you, monster. It's a, it's, it was the sleeper of its time because someone would up. roll up next to you in a Buick and you'd be like, hi old <laughs> man. And I'm, then I'm he, glad you're mentioning blow that. Past anything. Guess what I saw on Craigslist just earlier today that I went, Hmm. Yes. That would be uh what was it? A 98 or 99 Buick Regal GS. Which the GS had the supercharged 3800. I've I've always been interested in those cars. That engine was used in so many other applications. Of course, I mean we also have to talk about the Buick Grand National with their amazing engine um, that was also in the in the turbo transit. Fun fact: the fastest muscle car of the 80s was the turbo Trans Am. It wasn't yeah, a V8. It, it kind of only got neutered because it was beating the Corvette. It was yeah. faster than a Corvette in a straight line. And GM was like, oh, uh, uh, uh. oh, speaking of the 4.3 turbo and the Cyclone and the Typhoon. Yep. And we had, we didn't even talk about LS engines. Oh, okay, folks, we're going to have to come back to this. So, yeah. One one last quick shout out, though. Worst engines. Um didn't GM have that? Was the GM's industry did, too? Did, I mean, aside from the 301 turbo that they did with the 80 Trans Am turbo, that was just terrible. Didn't didn't GM almost kill diesel in the United States completely with their diesel V8? Yeah. It, 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 am I thinking of that correctly? I'm just going right off the top oh, of my head. I'm also thinking the V864, which was a oh, the, good the, idea, the first but massively ahead of its time. Like it, the technology just wasn't there, and was <laughs> yeah, there was there was no computer control. It, it was yeah, just... like cylinder deactivation. Like, oh, you think of that today? That's normal. It that I believe it was introduced in eighty one or eighty two. <laughs> the world was not ready for that. There, there's there's a difference between cylinder de cylinder deactivation and losing a cylinder. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's kind of what they did back then, losing a cylinder. So Basically, okay, yeah, we're gonna have to come back to more 
GM engine discussion in a future episode. Let's uh let's take a little pause and shout out to uh to some of our good listeners out there. Bruce, what do you got? Yeah, so we really like you know, we like getting comments from you guys. And one of the ways we feel like to encourage getting comments is to read them. So um, I'm gonna read two. I've got a short one and I've got one that's kind of longish that I'm gonna have to edit down. Um, so let me scroll down here. And and I've got one too to read. And uh, and again, we are rambling about cars and we want to ramble with you. So give us your feedback, give us your comment. You know, we're building up to where we're going to start having listeners as guests on our program. At Why? Point, yeah, definitely. because we want to talk cars. I mean, in case you haven't figured it out yet, we like to talk about cars. So YouTube, like and subscribe, Spotify, Google, Apple. Yeah. You, so you know what uh, let's swap back and forth here real quick. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to read this one. This one's from Nathan. Um, again, I'm not going to give his last name because I'm not sure if he wants us to or not. But Nathan has commented before. He sent us some really good renders. By all accounts, Nathan's a really good guy. And so he's commenting on episode four. Um, I, I'm, there's two parts here I kind of really want to put out. Um, firstly, I think the new GM logo is better than their previous one, but I still don't. Thank like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just wait a second. Honestly, <laughs> the previously, the previous one just looked dated with its 3d effect. Although I didn't mind the capital letters. The new one looks like an app icon, Agreed, but I don't think that's a negative. My biggest problem with the new logo is that it looks like they didn't fully commit to the gradient. It looks weird to me. Maybe because I still think of GM as a big old gas brand and not a futuristic tech brand. <laughs> you might have a point there. There's a lot of old timers out there that that's what GM is. And um, that's why you need a new logo. And I'll I'll be the first to admit, since that episode aired, it's been made abundantly clear to me by pretty much all of my coworkers, all of my friends, even my wife that my opinion on the GM logo was wrong. So I'm just going to have to say that they're all wrong. <laughs> and thank you, Nathan, for having a little bit of my back, at least. So Nathan then goes on and gives a longer thing about brand logos in general. And I apologize, Nathan, it's just a little bit long for this time. But I do want to get to the question that you ask at the end. So my question this week, why was there only one mid-engine Mazda Miata concept? I mean, why didn't it go into production? Because because others before it failed, the Toyota MR2, the Pontiac Fiero, the Fiat X19, etc. Anyway, I don't find any good renderings of it online. Uh, just kidding. Um, so yeah. And so I will disagree with you on one point there, Nathan. I don't consider the MR2 a failure only because no. I got three generations. There was the one in the eighties, which is kind of very angular. There's the one in the nineties. That's much smoother. And then there's the one when the MR2 spider come out. Is that Oh, one. I forget. Can but, we just pretend that it didn't come out? It, cause, cause that was, it, that was, come on. That was it, the kind of terrible. It's one. a three quarter scale boxster. It, it is what it is, but still a vehicle that gets three generations. I, Disagree with him in calling a failure, but regardless. So I do want to show the folks, though, what Nathan is talking about, because we actually have a really good story on MotorOne.com about the history of uh, the Miata. And so what you're looking at here is, uh, uh, and for the folks not watching on YouTube, I'll describe it. Um, on the left, you're looking at the front wheel drive concept that could have become the Miata. And Smith, I think you'll agree to me. That's a Mazda MX-6. Am I wrong? No, no. It it pretty much looks like an MX-6. Yeah. And so in the middle is the mid-engine concept that never kind of went anywhere. And then on the right is practically an NA Miata yeah. with some minor nips and tucks here and there. But yeah. Yeah. So this is what Nathan is talking about. They were, There was a period of time where that they were looking whether they would do front rear engine or front engine rear wheel drive and they kind of went with kind of what was obvious if we're being honest but thank god yeah <laughs> I, I mean i mean the mx6 was all right we don't need another one of those no the, the mid-engine concept come on that's a that's a pontiac fiero it's very pontiac it, it's it's a pontiac now i'd like the fiero 
but I don't need another one from Mazda. No. And, and that's Miata, the that was the car that we needed at that time, and that's why it's a legend. Yeah. And all and why they haven't done it today is it's just easier, you know, from maybe not necessarily an engineering standpoint. Like it does make sense to put the engine behind the driver, you get better performance, but from a manufacturing standpoint, like that's just what's normal is that, you know, you put the engine in front, it, maybe you have it drive the rear wheels, maybe you have it drive the front wheels, but it was just what was available. Also with the current ND, you have to remember that it spawned the Fiat 124 Spider, which is now retiring. So they kind of had that financial incentive to make, you know, Mazda actually produced those. So you kind of had two vehicles for the price of one. So, but yeah, it, I thought it was an interesting question and I thought it was a really good opportunity to go back to these old concepts and kind of show oh. what the Miata could have been. So no, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me, let me jump in here with a comment. We got a comment yeah. from, uh, from Blake um, and it's similar in that he's also talking about uh, the GM logo. Um, hey guys, listening to the show, liking it. Thank you very much. Good, sir. GM logo debate, Mini Cooper pictures size were two topics I'm less passionate about, but fully agree that Mini is getting further and further away from the plot. There you go, Bruce. You, you got you got some support there too, and and you know I'll agree to a, to a certain extent on that as well. Uh, my question to all of you is: Have you ever bought or not bought a vehicle because of its badging, emblem, or its parent company logo? And we kind of touched on this a little bit. I don't. I mean, I don't think anybody would i mean unless the logo was something ridiculous you know like the uh uh i don't know what, what's something that we can say that's pg-13 at least because <laughs> i think we can all come up with some, an automotive some emblem that's ever been so bad that you wouldn't buy the yeah i i i do think well i don't think i know that there are some people that never even considered the ford probe just because it was called probe, probe. um but i mean that's not that's not really a logo. That's a name. Um, I, the automaker would have to just make a very, very tragic decision, I think, to deter people from buying their product just because of their logo. But, but I think the logo, the design, um, however it's presented, goes a long way in persuading people to that brand. You have to have brand identity. The logo is centered. It, that's the center point of your brand identity. If you want to change your brand identity, that's a risky proposition in every in every manner. But it starts with that logo. And if you want to preserve your brand identity while moving forward, it's even more risky because you have to try to balance the old with the new. That was my argument for GM's logo. I thought they did a good job of balancing old with new. But all of my friends and even my wife said I was wrong. Yeah, um, I, I think the issue. So the thing that always comes immediately to my mind is Ford where it, for, you know, maybe the font might change, you know, it, there was a kind of a cursive thing at one time, but it has always been the word Ford in an oval logo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I can't imagine ever changing that. And it's, it's not quite the same, but the G M underline and this underline is still there underneath the M. It, it, well, I, I think, I think it's a, you bring up a good point. I think it's a safer move for GM because general motors has its own entity. Yeah. Does it, does it make a car? Correct. The only car they made was the EV one, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, unless there's some other obscure ones out there. Um, so yeah. you're not, so you're not changing really the logo that you're going to see yeah. on all of the cars. It might be etched the, onto a piece of umbrella. glass or etched onto a part. Right. You're never going to look at, you know, the back of a car and it, it, right. you're not changing the Chevy logo or right. so it, Cadillac, you know. So in that respect, I mean, GM is, is slightly, they're in a slightly different position than Ford because I mean, the Ford logo was on every Ford vehicle. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I think you'll still find some GM logos on some cars in some cases, but the, there's also going to be a Chevrolet logo. There's also going to be a Buick logo. There will also be a Cadillac logo. So I, th I think it's a, I think it's a safer move for, for GM. Uh, speaking of Cadillac here, um, I've got just a little bit more on Blake's comment here talking about Cadillac. What the hell did Cadillac do with renaming their two sports sedans? 
while shifting their replacements down class. Basically, he's talking about uh, and 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 I, I'm with him there. Um, did Cadillac really need to rename their V series V Sport? And then have their V B actually the V Sports to make room for a new V Blackwing, you know it, it can it, it it can tend to get confusing there. I have um, a feeling that's a short lived thing only because of what we're seeing with the lyric and the Celestique. Yep, you know Cadillac has basically more or less said they're going to go back to real names, and I think that the CT four V Blackwing, you know, etc. That they were kind of a victim of circumstance, a victim of timing. That you know, for these, for the what? What do you think? Three, four years that they're going to be available. The naming is going to be weird, but we are going to see Cadillacs with proper names again. Just like yep. it seems like, kind of in the industry, at least amongst older brands, that's the way things are going. You know, we're kind of expecting the next entry level Acura to be called the Integra again. So. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, I would support that direction. Um, Blake goes on to say that Blackwing makes zero sense, has it's named after a defunct engine that wasn't the most powerful nor experienced engine. The new Blackwing cars sound great. I haven't heard curb weight for either of them. Um, they'll, they'll be on a heavy side. I just hope that everyone isn't. I just hope everyone that isn't a car nerd understands what the vehicles are. I still have to remind myself that the CT4 is really an ATS replacement, but now a CLA competitor. I personally know car journalists who still get this wrong, which is telling. What do you guys think? So, I, I mean, we're talking about CT4 V Blackwing competitors. I mean, any, I mean, we can line that up against any really small compact sedan at this point. Yeah. It, it It's weird is the answer. It Cadillac. <laughs> Cadillac, like a lot Cadillac has been weird. Well, no, Cadillac, like a lot of brands, BMW is the one that's coming to mind immediately. They're yep. in this weird transition between internal combustion focused and EV focused. And we're at the weird crossroads of that. And so some decisions that I would hope that wouldn't be made in better times are being made. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we're seeing here. I, again, I hope it's not a long-term thing, but it is, it, it's where we are. And, and I think, and maybe on being on the journalist side, we might have a, a slightly better picture. I think Cadillac had a much larger plan for Blackwing. And I think, because I mean, you saw they, they made a big deal about their new engine they made a big deal about the CT six V and then it was just like, it seemed like at a snap of a finger, it was all gone. Yeah. And, and it struck me as okay. Cadillac had big plans for that engine going in other vehicles. They were going to create this new black wing line that centered around this black wing engine. And maybe there were even going to be other derivatives of this engine used. And then somebody higher up on the GM chain said, you know what? This is too expensive. It's gone. So now, or, so now we have to double that. that. We're going EVs. Yep. Th this is the end of the line. Yep. This is the end of the line, which also explains really why the, the CT five V Blackwing and the CT four V Blackwing There's are things. essentially carryovers of the ATS V and the CTS V. Right. I mean, I mean, they're both running the same powertrains. They've got a little bit more power. Um, but yeah, you know, Cadillac, I love Cadillac. I grew up with a 1960 Cadillac convertible in my family. And, uh, you know, I would love to see Cadillac go back to big proper names. I think there's still brand equity there. I've argued with a few people over the years about that. You know what? Not everybody remembers just the Cadillac Cimarron. Not everybody remembers crappy Eldorados <laughs> where where the bumpers would fall off and they would rust in a couple of years. There's still some brand equity in those names. So hopefully we see more properly named Cadillacs going forward in the future. Now, speaking oh, of going forward, move wait, on to your second. comments. I'm going to read yeah. one last comment. Yes, just yes, to yes. Everyone yes. there do. This came from BAC161 on motor1.com. He, uh, commented on our actual story and it's just one sentence gm's new logo reminds me of what the gm app would look like on my iphone it's more cartoonish and it lacks a stately presence so sorry smith one other guy that disagrees with you <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, you know what? I just flash back to Captain America's speech when the whole world is against you. You just plant yourself and you tell the whole world, move. That's right. GM, GM did good on their logo. Move okay. on. So do you want to introduce our second <laughs> segment then? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's hate him. Let's let's have some fun move on and not, move forward. Not like we haven't been having fun already. Yeah. Um, this whole talk of GM engines got Bruce and I talking. You know what are some neat GM vehicles throughout the you know, the company's history that we would like to have in our garage? But let's not go with the obvious. Oh, I, I want the Corvette, or I want the Camaro, or I want the Grand National, or I want the Chevelle. Let's find some quirky vehicles that maybe go under the radar that maybe don't get the love they deserve or that are just different. And uh, we decided we would try to pick three and we're going to present them here right now. I know all of you listening out there will probably have some interest in this and some feedback and you want to share some of your own choices. So send those choices in, but Bruce. So I need to make this clear that, you and I have not shown each other. Yes. This is a surprise coming forward. Yes. And I think you might fight me on my second choice, but we're not there yet. So let we'll see. Okay. I, I, I don't Go ahead I with think first. my second choice might be a bit too mainstream, but we'll we'll see when we get there. Okay. First choice though. Uh second gen Corvair Coupe. Oh, nice. Yes. Specifically the Corsa with the turbocharged engine. Yes. Oh, Which, bravo. Well done. So th- I can't remember. Is the brief, the second gen is 65 or 66. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Anyway, um, in 62, this was the first production. This and the Oldsmobile Jetstar were the first production cars in the world to have a turbocharged engine. And they were different turbocharged engines. This had an air-cooled flat six. The um, the Jetstar had a liquid-cooled V8. So they're not even vaguely related. So it, it's important in many ways. And I, I went back and forth on this, if I'm going to be honest. I love the boxiness of the first generation, but the second generation with those super skinny pillars, like <laughs> if this thing rolled over, you're dead. Like you're, oh, you're yeah. not going to survive. But Well, it wouldn't roll over. It would just snap over steer and, and no, put you not the seat. second generation. They fixed that. Yeah, Ralph but they, they, still, they still – they still kind of snap over Steve. The, the sway bars helped not nearly as bad as the first ones, but Hey, yeah. you know what? The first gen ones, uh, you might die, but you get used to driving it and you love it. Exactly. But it's just such a good, it's a very European shape. Like look at that and tell me that doesn't look like a European car from the late sixties. Well, like, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what they were going for. Right. I mean, that's I mean, that's what they were it going for. Was, yes, but it was also mainstream. Like it was a car you could buy at any Chevy dealer. Like mm-hmm. that wasn't an expensive car or an overly expensive car. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't the range topper in Chevy's lineup. That was a car any guy could go get. No, that's that's a very cool choice, Bruce. But there's one thing that you have to remember when you get a Corvair, you don't get just one. Have you ever have you ever seen a Corvair sitting at somebody's house and it's the only Corvair. There's always like at least two or three in the backyard. So I mean, when you make the Corvair commitment, <laughs> extra parts, when you make the Corvair commitment, you got to go all in, right? You're not, you're not wrong. <laughs> I, I'm not fighting you there. No, I'm glad you have that. But I no, almost, I, I almost Corvair put a Corvair. Is, uh, Hold on. I, I got to show you Uh-oh. super mod girl. And I don't know how I would describe the guy, but the girl's super mod. So we got to give her some credit here. This is again, like that's just a good shape. No B pillar. Like yep. that, that would definitely be a coupe. Yeah. I mean, th- it's a good looking car. Yeah, I think it's a great you looking car. Also, it's a car you don't look at and you think, oh, that's a rear engine car. It's not like, you know, a Volkswagen or even a Porsche. Like the proportions are even between the front and rear that 
you could tell someone, oh, yeah, there's a V8 under the hood, and they might believe you if they didn't mm -hmm. know what they were looking at. The only thing that's a little weird about, about that generation Corvair, I mean, you could almost say the back and the front are pretty identical. It's if you close. put a if you put a steering wheel at the back seat facing backward, it would not look out of place. No, dude, you're not getting any fight from me. Okay, well, so well done, well that's done. My choice one. Well done. Now it's time for my first choice, and I sort of touched on this a little bit with the engines that I was talking about. Do you okay. have? Do, do you want to make any guess before I bring this up here? Engine. I mean, I talked You're about the small, about small block. Chevy mostly. I talked about LS. I talked about LS. The ZR1. I talked. To, we talked about the 3800s, right? Right. So, is it something with the 3800? Because that seems up your alley. No, it's not. It's not. In okay. fact, it's the Quad oh. Four. Look at that! Look at that! That is a 1991 Oldsmobile Cutlass Calais. 442. That's the last 442 officially from Oldsmobile. In the old days, 442 stood for um, four barrel carb, four speed, dual exhaust. <laughs> this I obviously didn't have a four barrel yeah. carb. Um, I can't remember what they, what they said 442 uh, stood for on this. It was something different. Yeah, they they kind of I've, messed with their wording. I've That's always had a weird thing for these cars. The, the quad four okay uh, it, it vibrated a little bit the balance shafts that they put in later on helped um but i mean 2.3 liter um i can't remember if the olds had the two three or the two four but I think all, that one had a two three the two four i think came a bit later but but i mean these cars ultimately got to 180 horsepower from a fairly small four cylinder that was really good. I mean, like really good for mm -hmm. the time today in 2021, you're going to be hard pressed to find four cylinders that do a lot better than that. So, I mean, bravo to GM and, and Oldsmobile for having this engine back in the day. I mean, those cars with a five speed manual, th they would rev pretty good. Um, yeah. I mean, I know there are people that aren't the biggest fans of the quad four, um, but I just, I look at that now and I think, why do I hate the Grand Am so much and like this? I just don't. I I respect the engine. I don't love the the design, the you know the exterior styling. It's just it's I it's there are too many bad memories of the early '90s kind of mixed in there. <laughs> that might be a podcast for another time, and on a different channel. But I I mean I, I hear you. Um, I'm not a big fan of that body style, but for some reason, but the engine explain, itself is impressive. The, the, the engine is a neat good engine with a five speed. I mean, I mean, that was, I mean, that was a quick car back in the yeah, day. The, totally. There were, there were few new cars, honestly, that were significantly quicker than that. So yeah, there's, there's my first weird kind of oddball choice. I'll have one of those someday because. I'm apparently in the minority. The, there aren't many people that love them. And you can, like, and you can, you can get, get them pretty one. cheap. Yeah. You can, you can get them pretty cheap, but okay. Number, number two, number two. Okay. This is the one that I might, uh, that I you might, might fight me on this. And I would, I, I can't really fight back against it. So, and I've got several things to show here. 1965 Buick Riviera. I will never in the world fight you on that. But uh, no, not that it's cool, that it's quirky. And the reason I picked the 65 is, especially with this image, because it's a really good time lapse time lapse shot, that it kind of shows the hidden headlights in place, but also shows them on. And for anyone that's not familiar and for who is hopefully watching our uh, video, I do actually have a video of that showing them deploy. So Smith, you'll get to see this too. Um, so that's closing. <laughs> Very, it's a slow pro. It's not a beautifully process, right, but the right. open, it's just so dramatic. Like can we here, have a I whole, come. can we have a whole episode of just hidden headlights from the oh, 60s there goes. and 70s? Look, it's just, it, it clam shells open and then the headlights come on. And from the outside, 
it's just such it creates such a clean design like it does it, it's weird you don't realize it when you're looking at it but it's odd to see a car with no headlights until they deploy and if, from a functional standpoint i bet it's a just a horrible because like anytime <laughs> there's no like flash to pass or anything like right that. It's right like, it's a very slow process to open and close but it's gorgeous it so really it, is and it's worth noting that it was a one year only feature that the year before that they have actual kind of headlights the year after that they kind of incorporate them differently mm -hmm. so it, it, it's special in that sense i mean that's a car that would literally wink at you yeah, literally. Literally, the way the way those lenses, the way those covers open and close is literally winking at you. You know, I got to tell you, my honorable mentions include a 55 Riviera. That was actually technically before Riviera was a model. That was back it was like the well, I think it was the the Super um based on the Roadmaster, but there was the Riviera trim that had the four portholes in the front fender. A lot of people go for the 55 Chevy of that era. I mm -hmm. always liked the Riviera because it had those portholes. It didn't have the fender skirts on the back. It had just the it had the open fenders with the chrome that would just kind of sweep right down in front and back. That almost made my list. So we almost had two Rivieras here. Well, wait, one uh, people on YouTube saw me just try to share this, but so let me give it a proper chance here. Okay. I also want to note it is not a 65 but <laughs> Spock owned a Riviera. That is a logical choice. So I mean, sorry, folks. I hear the groans. It had to be said. Come on, it's Spock. Of course, yeah, it had to be. That's said. either a sixty-three or sixty-four. But still, logical choice. Yeah, that was his car. So it, it's worth noting. Okay, so pick two for you. You are in good company. Pick number two. Guess what? I'm going to stay with a four-cylinder. I know all of, all of the GM cars. I'm going with two four cylinders. People are saying, "Smith, what do you think?" What's thinking? your second four? Now I'm curious. Look at that! Look at that! The oh, picture. The, the, the okay. picture looks a little bit smaller up here on the screen. Yep, 1975 Chevy Cosworth Vega. I know the Vega isn't the best, most favorite car of all time, but the Cosworth Vega with the black and the gold. That Cosworth tuned four cylinder. Um, I, I mean, what was that? I think it was a two liter twin cam four cylinder. I think it made what uh, like 110 horsepower. I mean, come on, it's it's the mid 70s, but 110 horsepower from a two liter four cylinder. And the Ford V8s of the time were making like 140. Come on, so it this, was this, a two liter, but here's the sad part, <laughs> and this is the sad. So before they knocked all of like the emission stuff on it, and I, I'm looking this up only because I actually have a story on this car saved. It was supposed to make 260 horsepower. Do you know what it made? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, in, in production trim, I'm pretty sure it was 110. I'm actually seeing, maybe I'm right. I was seeing 140. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought it was oh, 110. It is 110. It is 110. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they weren't super powerful, but, but for, I mean, for the air emission stuff, like if they could have figured out a way to make that engine it now, essentially a two liter four cylinder, like it could have been so much better. Would that not be a cool car to just do a little resto mod on? I mean, I know it'd be sacrilege. Well, I mean, no, I don't you, think you, it would be. No, you, you, you could keep that Cosworth two liter. Yeah, and and just just tweak it up, you know, add a little bit to it, provided you can find one that hasn't rusted away. These cars were rather notorious, just like the Pintos, for rusting pretty horrifically. But I've always been interested in these cars. I always thought they looked neat. I always thought that uh, that twin cam four cylinder was just like the anti. It, it, it was the anti Trans Am of the time, right? Oh, totally. It was, yeah, it was no. It, 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 so what? GM, or, you know, Chevy was trying to do at the time is that this was during kind of the oil crisis, the oil embargo, and they wanted to be able to provide people with performance, but they couldn't do it with massive big blog V8s anymore. Right. So 
they, you know, they went to Cosworth, who at the time they had, you know, the DFV for there was a period in Formula One racing where Cosworth engines were practically a one make series that just it was the de facto choice. Oh, you just got the Cosworth. So they were a, a very, very respected name. And it, it made sense. It's just mm -hmm. unfortunate that it kind of coincided also with that emissions era. So it was never quite as powerful as it should have been. Yeah, but you know what? It was still cool, and it's still cool. Oh, totally. I would, and I would still love to have one. Bruce, take us away on number three. So number three, I think I'm going to surprise you. Uh -oh. I think. Because it was never off. It is not a GM product from the United States. Oh, no. You are not going there. We This is not happening. You, you'll see why this is not happening when I get to my choice. Go ahead. Okay, we'll see. Oh, oh, that's the engine. Sorry. We will start with the engine. <laughs> I know what it is now, and it's cool. It is a Lotus <laughs> Omega. Sometimes yes. it's called a Lotus Carlton. Yes. It is the Lotus Tune version of the Opal Omega or the Voxel Carlton. Um, same brand, different region, same car, just left-hand drive versus right-hand drive. But... These things were just stupid powerful in the early 90s. They were monsters. And Wasn't that the fastest production sedan one year? So it, it was the debate was between that and like a Bentley Turbo R, apparently. Like there some people, some testers said one, some testers said the other, but obviously this is not a Bentley. This is a car that, you know. The I guess the average rich guy versus the super av affluent guy could afford. Um, I am going to pull up a photograph of the outside for you folks now. I just got to say, well done on your choices. There we go. So this was a three liter twin turbo in line six that was introduced in 1990. And just like let that sink in a second because like okay twin turbo inline six that's normal today um and actually i am sorry um uh so uh, lotus took opal's three liter they punched it out it is a 3.6 liter twin turbo inline six um and it's just so f so cool looking <laughs> so quick um uh power was quoted at 377 horsepower um interestingly enough and we wrote about this recently the person that is taking over ford's head of design uh designed the changes to this car so he didn't design the actual you know opal omega but he designed the tweaks that created the lotus version because he was working at lotus at the time so <laughs> the guy that might design your next mustang or be in charge of your next mustang had a hand in this. And uh, it can't be overstated enough. A twin turbo in line six was, was interesting enough, but on a kind of a chunky sedan, nobody, nobody did this back then. This was still an no. era where sedans were just boring everyday family cars, really BMW. I mean, they, of course, you know, they had their sports sedans, but even BMW wasn't at on a crazy extreme level. Audi wasn't at a crazy extreme level. This to, to do this to a sedan back then was just bonkers. And, and it's kind of I the love classic it. muscle car recipe. They took a mid-sized sedan, they took the engine out of it. This was introduced in 1990. Production ended in super late 92, early 93. Um, so yeah, they they took a car. An Opel Omega Voxel Carlton was just a car that anyone could buy, but then Lotus took it and pumped up everything, and this was the result, and it's really cool, and it's really rare, but since it's a Voxel uh, Opel product, it is a GM product. So It is. I, I will give you that. So you're number three. I will give you that, and with that in mind, I need to stress one more time to everybody listening. 
Bruce and I did not talk about this ahead of time. No, not at we all. did not discuss our picks at all. Nope. We didn't discuss the order we were going to do our picks at all. Bruce, your two choices were very close to being on my list. And now for my third choice, we also go out of the country. You're doing a hold, aren't you? And <laughs> yes. 1973 Holden Monero Holden. I mean, hey, Australia, that was a mainstream car. You might yeah. want to fight me on that. That was a mainstream car, but not in America, only in no. Australia. Yeah. The, the 73 Monero GTS going back to small blocks. You could get that with a 350. I can't remember the uh, the exact horsepower rating. I mean, they weren't slouches. The uh, the seventies weren't quite as as drastic to uh, to horsepower in Australia as they were right. in the United States. Yeah, it took a little bit longer for that to get there. That mm. was more of an late seventies, early eighties right. thing. And that's so, just, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a great looking car. Um, I mean, it's 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 still a muscle car, but oh, totally. if you were if you were to have one in the states, I, I mean, I I bet probably the vast majority of people wouldn't even know what it was. They might be like you look at it, and there are certain Chevy lines to it. There's certain, you know, you look at that. There and are, like, did, you know, is that a Nova? Like what? But yeah, no one, no one's gonna guess. Oh, you've got a Holden because a lot of Americans right. don't even know what a Holden is. And and now I will say I don't have a picture, but if you paint that all black, a lot of people might recognize it easier. Because that was one of the cars featured in the original uh, uh, The Road Warrior. Yeah. Or Mad yeah. Max. The, 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 night, the, the night Rider. Yeah. Was was driving around in a black 70. I think it was a 73 Holden Monero. And I think they also had some Moneros that they were using for their, for their, uh, for their police cars. Their main force patrol cars. But I'm a big Mad Max fan. That's where I first saw this car. In a previous life uh, when I was working with a wood chipper company doing marketing work. We actually had an Australian dealer um, who was big into cars and racing. And he actually sponsored uh, with the company that I was working with. He actually sponsored a Holden Monero in their, in their, their classic uh, racing series. I'm trying to remember um, like, like masters series or something like that. And I, I just, I just, I loved it. I would love to have one, not mainstream in America, mainstream in Australia. That's a, those are my choices, Bruce. I, I, well, I hold think on a second here. I got the internet movie automotive database up and I've got your, uh, uh -oh. I've got her. See when we're, when you. we're done, I'm going to have to go watch Mad Max again. Not the new one. The, the old one, the new one's pretty good too. The, the, new go. one, the new one's good, but yeah, look at that. Huh? Yeah. I am the night rider. <laughs> So yeah, it it it's there. Movie cars. There's there'll be another topic for uh, for yeah. podcasts in the future. Well, folks, I mean, Mad Max has so many good cars. Like <laughs> they're all Australian stuff. So it's stuff that like we're not quite familiar with, but also kind of like uh, you know, oh, is that a Torino? No, that's a no. that's an Australian Falcon. Like yeah, that's a Falcon. They kind of look the same. You know what I'm saying though. I can't yeah. believe I can't believe that we mirrored our picks American American overseas. Well, in in that order and I'm I'm a little creeped out that your picks even though I didn't have them for my I mean those cars were on my on my honorable mentions. I also had like the 70 Buick GS wagon on there that I was thinking about. Um, I had the Lumina Z34 with a five speed that I was thinking about. Oh, dude, that's a crap box. <laughs> I, I don't I don't like the interiors, but the, just the Z34s, it would have to be with a five speed. But with that 3.4 double overhead cam engine, it, it was it was kind of a cool car. Uh, OK, yeah, it, it, agree it, to disagree. <laughs> it wasn't on my list. So it sure. Yeah. So it, it didn't make the cut. No. So that's the thing is that. I have largely come from a Chrysler, Mopar, whatever you call it, Ford family. There, there haven't been nearly as many GM vehicles that I've kind of grown up with. My mom always, always, always wanted a Corvair. I don't know why. 
that's just like the car that she always wanted. So th that's kind of my Corvair pick. And the other ones are kind of stuff I've learned about since I've been into cars. So, well, and to our listeners, what's your list? What's your three quirky GM vehicles throughout GM's entire history? Their yeah. Entire don't, don't, don't give us a Chevelle. Don't give us a Corvette. You know, is there, a, do you feel passionate about a Saturn like, you know, is there something interesting out there? Let us know. Well, you know, like we read during our middle section on this one, if there's something out there and you give us a good reason why, we'll read it. So please send straight it up. I, I would love to revisit this in the next episode yeah. or, or the next next few episodes. So hit us up podcast at motor one dot com. That's the address. Or, or you can leave us comments over at YouTube. Like and subscribe. You can leave us comments on our article that will go up at motor one dot com on Friday. Mm -hmm. Bruce, take us out, man. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening as always. Uh, have a good night. Have a good morning. Have a good afternoon, depending on when you're listening to this. So thank you much. Bye-bye.